Holden Crane found himself with a noose around his neck, standing on a bridge, his hands tied behind his back, his face and body badly beaten. The crowd was at least twenty people deep, close to three hundred, he thought, many holding torches that shone brightly in the clear night, casting his shadow before his shoeless feet. He could hear them yelling angrily. One voice stood out from the rest, a woman, sobbing uncontrollably, her body shaking so badly that she was folding over, a man, her husband. Holding her up as best as he could, the man's own face, tear-stained, blood on the woman's hands and clothing, her child, five-year-old Colby, laying lifeless at her feet, his injuries too severe to survive his violent wounds, the man's shirt also bloody and sticking to his skin. Holden's own hands felt thick and sticky, the warm fluid beginning to coagulate, his clothing muddied with the fluid and dirt. Suddenly, Holden was picked up by three of the town's largest men and tossed over the edge of the bridge. He could feel his body falling towards the rushing river, the sound nearly blocking out the sound of the villagers, now clapping, except the woman. Her wails could still be heard and felt reverberating through his bones, sending a sharp, painful chill into his soul, like one thousand pieces of glass shredding his insides, churning inside of him. The rope tightens before he feels himself hit the water with a loud splash, sinking nearly to the bottom, his body instantly feeling as though it is freezing, his head pounding, the water turning him back and forth as he struggles to get his hands untied. He feels himself beginning to panic as he wriggles his arms, tugging and pulling. When at last he's free, his head bobs up from beneath the water, and he's still hearing the crowd and the moaning cries. He knows that he must get to shore as quickly as possible, but the water is crashing down on him as if trying to drown him right here. He doesn't know how far he's traveled downstream when the flow eases up, and he's washed ashore against the hard rocks lining the river. His body beaten. He's freezing to death. He tries to adjust his eyes in the night's darkness, lit only by the sliver of the moon. He pulls himself along the rocks until he's no longer in the water and sits on the wet grasses with the croaking toads, the slithering snakes, the crickets chirping in his ears. He cannot hear the crowd any longer, but he knows that he needs to find shelter and soon. He walks for what feels like hours, hoping to keep ahead of the crowd, which he assumes is out looking for him, until he comes upon a cabin. There's a fire in the fireplace and two oil lamps in the windows. He begins to walk up to the cabin and then stops to look down at his clothing, squinting to see if the blood from the child was washed away by the water in the river, and he can't tell. He stands still, not knowing what he should do. Should he risk coming into contact with a person if he's still stained with blood? Then he realizes that he has no choice. If he doesn't at least try, he will surely die out here. And... If it goes badly, well, he'll just take care of that when it happens. He slowly walks up the stairs. The wood creaks under his bare feet. He looks into a window, but he doesn't see anyone. As he raises his hand and knock on the door, he hears a man's voice call out, Come in, he says. Holden imagines that the man has heard his footsteps as he places his hand on the doorknob, but he doesn't turn it. He's unsure if this could be a trap. But how could it be, he asks himself, trying to work it out in his head. Surely the river pushed him much farther than the crowd could travel, even on horseback. I said, come in. The man calls out again, and Holden turns the knob and slowly opens the door. Inside is a man of about thirty years old. His skin is not wrinkled from the sun like the men he knows. Holden assumes that the man must have some money, so he isn't forced to work in the blistering heat of the summer. This begins to plant ideas into Holden's head. He's always looked out for himself. He's always relied on only his own wits to see him through. 
His mother died in childbirth. His father left him with an aunt who blamed him for her sister's death. He'd become angry with an unjust world, and he made sure to take his revenge whenever he saw an opening to do so. He relished in taking the beloved first child from their family, or the only son, or the beloved daughter. The more pain he inflicted on others, the less he felt of his own deep pain. He would rob a good man of his earnings and kill a bad man for not being bad enough. The man didn't even seem to be afraid or even curious of Holden. "'Go stand by the fire, son,' he said, waving his hands toward the fireplace. "'And close that damn door you're letting all the cold air in,' he snapped. Holden felt compelled to go stand by the fire and to ignore that the man had snapped at him like a child. Under normal circumstances, that alone would be enough for Holden to pull a knife out and press it into the skin of the man's neck. Holden didn't even have shoes right now, let alone a knife.' and he didn't like the feeling of being powerless. The man left the room and came back with a bottle of whiskey. He took a long pull on the bottle, his throat moving as he swallowed, and then he handed it to Holden. Here, warm up that blood. Holden took it, gladly, and threw his head back, and he let the liquid flow down his throat and into his stomach, warming him all the way down. Holden expected the man to ask what had happened, but he didn't. He stood there, watching Holden. He was dressed all in black with a ruby stone at his neck, a black hat, the rim perfect, no sweat stains. His boots shined, snakeskin. He put one hand into his pocket, and he sat on the bar stool near the fire, one leg resting on the bottom of the stool peg, the other outstretched, his toe resting on the floorboard. His eyes were bright blue, his hair long and wavy, pulled into a loose ponytail, his lips bright red. His stare was making Holden feel uncomfortable, and Holden couldn't remember the last time that had happened. "'What's your story, son?' finally came from the man, and it made Holden jump. "'No story,' replied Holden. The man shifted on the stool, both arms now crossed across his chest, the ruby twinkling in the firelight. Don't jerk my chain, son. I know you're kind. I've seen them a million times. Harder than you, believe me. Smarter than you, too. Now open that mouth of yours, and don't even try it. He looked at Holden's hand, the hand that still held the bottle of whiskey. Holden had been thinking of swinging it at the man. Harder than him. Smarter than him. Who was this man? He was thinking when the thought slipped out of his mind like it had been snatched. Same as all of them, I'm guessing, replied Holden. No parents. Ma's dead. Pa ran off with a saloon girl. Yeah, said the man. Same story, different face attached. I've heard it. Was hoping you'd be more original, I guess. He reached for the bottle, and Holden passed it to him. He watched the man drink from the bottle, his skin as pale as a ghost, thought Holden. "'What's your story?' asked Holden, his clothes beginning to feel dry, his head pounding so hard that he was beginning to feel ill, the pain reaching into his neck and back. "'Oh, mine's as old as time. Watching. Waiting.' Watching and waiting for what? asked Holden. You know, your kind. Your story was told millenniums ago. Waiting for one worthy of my time. You're not him. Holden was feeling sick to his stomach. The pain from his head rushing through his body, he began to feel himself falling, and then a quick jerk. As the noose tightened around his neck, and he dangled from the bridge, swinging in the night air, his body convulsing for approximately 30 seconds before he finally swung limp. <laughs>